All right. Welcome back to this week's edition of the Rock and Roll Ghost Podcast. This week we have filmmaker Tim Bogart, uh, son of Casablanca Records founder uh, Neil Bogart. He made Spinning Gold um, about his father. Welcome to the show, Tim. I uh, hope you're doing well today. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm glad to have you. Um, so I there I, I've I had a little I've had a little bit of issue sleeping lately. So I took. <laughs> I took uh, something last night and it kicked in a little bit early. And then uh, like right before it, it kicked in, I had noticed that I wasn't able to log on to see the movie, even though I had it for a bit. I wanted to wait until I got closer to the interview to watch or watch it. So luckily Mia at your comp at you know, the pr- press uh, company uh, was able to sort that out. And I, when I woke up in the middle of the night, I, you know, I watched, uh, I'll admit I watched most of it and then I was started going to sleep again. So it's, it, it, I, but that's not lack of interest. Uh, I got, I have to really tell you that, um, you know, I was genuinely, I w- didn't know what to expect. And, you know, you see all these music bios and you feel like, you know, you're kind of, uh, you've built up a resistance to them to some degree. And you figure out where it's how it's gonna go, and you know the the standard stuff. But what uh, I think I really loved about the film is that you really showed your dad's love of actual music. Um, you <laughs> Thank know, you. You know, you don't. You, yeah. Not to get off on a tangent, but I have tried twice to watch. Uh, I've gotten through like two-thirds of Elvis on HBO Max. And for me, that might be the worst music biopic I've ever seen in my life because it almost has nothing to do with the music. It almost has nothing to do with Elvis. Um, I am gobsmacked at the fact that this was, number one, successful. Number two has not been nominated for Oscars. Austin Butler is great, but it's hardly an Elvis movie. Um, no, you know, that, that, that's, that is the challenge of, I think, of these movies. And, and the fact that you phrased it that way is literally the one thing I kept promising myself it actually had to be. Right? Yeah. It had to be about people who love music because yeah. I, like you, uh, I love music biopics, but I have always struggled to see them beyond the, well, here's another cautionary tale of someone who had some talent yeah. Ends up right. with a metaphorical needle in their arm somehow. The rise, a the rise, the problems, it. the, the yeah. fall, the, the yeah. possible redemption. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I really was trying to do really precisely what you said was to create a love letter to music and the people who made it. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm, thrilled that, I'm thrilled that you felt that way. No, well, because that was that was the thing that really shone through with me is just that, it, it, you know, obviously I, I would have to imagine that you could dense because you have to, and that's the problem I have when people say, well, it didn't actually come together like that. Well, of course not. We don't have, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> this isn't a multi-season series where we can sit there and take the week it took to make the song. You know, you okay. have to condense real life things to their essence to indicate the magic of what creating art is. And, you know, th- I mean, that, that is, I think, the greatest challenge for, for biopics. It was certainly a tremendous challenge here. Um, but, but I think there's kind of two, two different challenges. One is you're, you're saying you're creating a look at history. So you can't make stuff up, although people do it all the time. Sure. Um, I, I, coming out of the music world, having grown up in it, I, I really thought staying really close um, to exactly what happened was a crucial compass for us to follow. Um, but, but that really gave birth to one of the, the original ideas that I had for the piece, specifically about how to tackle music, was I wanted to show the first drafts of music. Because ultimately, how do you do a movie and, and, and match the, the, the spectacular master that Gladys Knight will ultimately make, or that Bill Withers right. will ultimately make? Like, you can't ever compete with those. And so instead of trying to compete with them, I wanted to see what was it like the first time Bill Withers sang Lean on me. It was like the first time Gladys Knight said, I think it should be Midnight Train. And so once I I came up with that concept, I was able to tell stories that maybe we didn't hear. I was able to explore periods of time before the actual releases. And I think that created a great freedom to 
um, move around the timeline without actually changing the historical facts. And that, that was really important. Yeah. Um, and just, I, I received a little message and I, I normally do this at the beginning, so I apologize, but the theater is on March 31st. So this interview will be timed to that release date. So uh, make sure to check all your, I, I said this yesterday with Supercell, um, another uh, interview I did. It's like, you know, with the, with, in the indie movies you really have to uh look through your local theaters each week to see what's playing uh because a lot of times um you know the the mega corporate you know theater chains won't uh necessarily advertise that something's there you have to kind of find things so i want people to make sure that they're the week of march 31st to check your local theaters to see if it's playing near you um, and like I said, I'm only, I'm only about two thirds of the way through it. And I, I think it's a brilliant film. So sorry to get Thank off you. topic there, but I wanted to Thank make you. sure to put that in there. Well, you know, the question I had, um, your, your father had four children. Uh, where, where were you in that mix? I, I, that I didn't know. Sure. So I, I was the eldest son. There, there were three okay. kids from the original pairing. And then my youngest brother, Evan, who, uh, did the music on the film is um, from the second pair, the second love of his life. Uh, but I was, I'm the eldest son, second of the original three. So I was right in the middle of the original three. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you had, you had, uh, got to know your father a, a little bit more than, you know, uh, the, young, perhaps. the younger yeah. ones for, for, for sure. And, and look, people, people's relationships with their parents is always a fascinating thing. Um, my father was obviously quite larger than life. And so even yeah. though I was 12 when I passed, when he passed away, um, you know, I spent every day after school at the Casablanca Records uh, offices uh, at Sunset. I mean, so I, I might've been young, but we were in the middle and the heart of what that was. So I really got a, uh, an extraordinary look at what his, um, what his life was like, what his world was like, um, and what his dreams were like. It was, it was an amazing ride. Yeah. Now, was, did you, I mean, you obviously spent a lot of time with him. You spent a lot of time in the, in the thick of things, as you, you yep. kind of indicate. What did you do to kind of go back and to, to get the feel of how his energy was, uh, like how he actually, because, you know, to be honest, like, um, you know, with, with uh, my father, he, you know, we had a bad relationship and he, he split when I was like 14. And mm -hmm. I, I, I can't remember exactly how he sounds or you know i remember certain things but it's like you know i i have to imagine that it, it, it was difficult to kind of conjure uh specifics did you have a lot of archival footage to to lean back on to get an idea we did so, so um whether this was the whether this was the result of the 70s or just the result of him you know my my father as an executive um, would be on talk shows all the time. Like you go back to the great Merv Griffin or, you know, or, or, oh, or nice. Mike Douglas shows and he would do our shows. Now, this was another version of Payola. He would basically take over the whole hour show. He'd be the main anchor and then he'd go, and now let me show you Donna Summer. And now yeah. here's the village people. So I actually had quite a bit of material of him uh, doing interviews. He also, as a, as a younger man, uh, as the movie tells, wanted to be a, a star himself. So I also have a bunch of him performing. Uh, so yeah, there was a lot of archival stuff, but I will tell you the thing that probably informed it most was I did literally years and years of interviews and I would keep going back. And I mean, from Clive Davis to George Clinton, the executives to the artists, I asked everybody everything, which is a rather um, bizarre experience for a kid to, to do a forensic uh, <laughs> investigation into their parents. Um, but I, I, I learned so much from the people whose lives he touched and, and the people that were really close to him. But yeah, I also had wonderful archiving material. Yeah, and um, what, what you said you were doing these, these interviews, was the idea always for a film or were you planning a book uh, perhaps? You know, interesting, it wasn't a book. For, it, he passed in 82. And, and yeah. while I was very young, I would say, you know, the, the world gave it about six months before people were coming in trying to get the rights. Now, at, at the time, and I'm not kidding, right away in 83, yeah. people were off. But, but back then, a lot of it was for a Broadway show. Uh, people thought that there was a lot of value in that. And this is kind of way pre-Jersey Boys kind of right, saying, right. Here's, here's what a jukebox music could be. And I would say for the first... Um, 10 or, or 15 years after his death, I, uh, one of my biggest jobs is I kind of took on the mantle of being responsible for the story was just saying no to people. 
No, we're not going to give you the rights for music. No, we're not going to give you the rights for the movie. But um, I, in 1999, uh, I actually set the project up for the first time at a studio. And that's when I really began the interviewing process to do it as a film. Uh, and so it really was a deep dive going, how the hell do you tell a life story? And, and what part of the life story should it be when he's not the star we all know? How do you crack that? How do you crack right. that code? So it was interviews for a movie, really, from the beginning. Okay. Um, what what got you into making, you know, films or, you know, uh, this, this you know, filmmaking process? What, what was the, not music, you know, what... It was, it was, it, it, you know, my, my father was, um, even though he was in the heart of music, look at Kiss, look at Parliament, it was a very visual kind of music. So yeah. growing up, I was on the set of the films they were making. I was uh, on the music videos uh, with the earliest versions of music videos. They were just kind of being thought of what those could be. Um, lest we forget the great Kiss meets the Phantom at, at the park. I seem to remember that as a child, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was there. So uh, while music kind of ran to my, my other siblings, um, for whatever reason, I picked up a, a, one of those, you know, so that old story, I had an eight millimeter camera at eight years old and I'm running around the backyard with my Star Wars toys. And um, mm -hmm. I, I just knew, and at 12 actually, maybe uh, after he passed away, and maybe this was my, my um, effort to, to deal with losing a father so young, I wrote my first screenplay at 12. It was a terrible screenplay, but it was 120 pages. So it was something. Um, and I really never looked back. Yeah. Um, you know, I, and my, my apologies for not knowing this as well, but uh, what, what is the current state of Casablanca Records? Is that something the family owns? Did, did that get no. kind of swallowed up uh, so by another company? Well, so I won't ruin the end of the movie. You should go back and watch it. You'll see a okay. little bit. Um, but no, it, 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 it's, it's uh, well known. So Casablanca, um, when my father left, was, was um, ultimately sold to Polygram, which then was ultimately absorbed by Universal. Uh, right. Then it went dormant for many, many years. Um, and then actually Universal decided, hey, this is a great name. This is a great logo. People still right. think it's something of value. So they relaunched it. Um, years ago as a disco label. And it's actually quite an active disco label currently at Universal. Uh, the, the family, family's got nothing to do with it anymore, but it's still got the same logo and it's still a very active Universal label. Yeah. Now, how, how did, um, how was growing up after your father passed? I mean, uh, did, I, I know this is kind of like a tacky question in a way, but was, was he, you know, were his finances in a, in a position where you grew up you know, not able to downsize your lives at all or anything? <laughs> well, it's, it's actually, no one's asked me that question. Um, one would think if they watched the movie, boy, it, it, that, that story ended really well. A funny thing happened on the way to that. Um, I, I guess taxes were an interesting thing in the 70s as well, sure. uh, <laughs> in the early 80s. Um, my father actually, when he, when he sold Casablanca, he started another company called Boardwalk. Uh, Boardwalk's... Uh, right. Um, signed Joan Jett. Um, so, so we had Joan Jett, um, ultimately Night Ranger, uh, Ringo Starr, a bunch of other acts um, that they were producing movies, musicals. And unfortunately, when he passed, um, all that was quite exposed. So in fact, there was very little left um, uh, from, from what that estate would have been or could have been. Um, it got me through college and it, and it got me a, a Dodge Daytona. It got me a car. <laughs> it got me through, through NYU in a car. Um, and I always thought actually having grown up with such excess and, and opportunity gave you a great taste for it. And then it was all ripped away. So now yeah. go earn it yourself, which is what he did. He earned it himself. So, um, so it was an interesting trip, but, um, no, know, I, 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 yeah, I, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's like, I, I have to imagine, you know, as somebody that grew up, you know, poor, honestly, it's like the idea of having it and then not having it seems more frightening than not having it at all. I, I, think, that's, uh, I think that's absolutely true. When, you, when you're you know, on private planes going to a KISS concert, that's and that, and then that all goes away. Because you're not prepared for at all. how to deal with no, you know, not nothing, but not what you had. It, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. And I'm sure there's somebody out there going, oh, poor him, he was on a private plane. And yeah. then like, that, that he didn't I'm have sure. a private plane. It's like, but no, the idea is that you, you know, you're, especially as a child, you know, your, your world is shaped a certain way. And then your world, it, it gets leveled. And it's, you know, first you lose your father, which is the, the worst. 
but then you know it's like how you live you have to it's 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 a different type of trauma i think in, in a way and i know trauma is probably a hard word for some people to swallow but you know just thinking it in that way it's uh well, and 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 look at it at 12, you're not responsible for either the opportunity to be on a private plane or to not, right? You're just right. kind of, a li you're, you're literally just there for the, for the ride. ride. Yeah. You're literally along the ride. Um, but I, what I would say was undeniable growing up, and then certainly my ability to educate uh, myself to, to the facts that supported it, my father's work ethic more than anything was was just the most inspirational thing as a kid. And I think all of the, of the siblings, we saw how hard he worked um, yeah. that he was relentless in the pursuit of, of the life he wanted and the dreams he was pursuing um, and that he infused in, in all of us. Um, and, then, and then getting to learn just how poor he was when he started, just how unlike, right. unlikely his success story was uh, provided all that additional engine fuel, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I could see it. And then uh, your siblings are all part of the film as well, correct? That's correct. Um, I, I am, I'm honored and blessed to work with my uh, my brothers. My sister's not in the business, but her, she is a character in, in the film. Right. Uh, but my but my my brother is Brad. Brad Bogart's a producer on the film, and he's been a producer with me on all my projects for years and years. Um, and Evan Bogart, the the baby Bogart brother, um, among other things, wrote Halo uh, with Ryan Tedder for Beyonce. Extraordinarily talented songwriter, um, and he uh, nice. worked with me to craft all the the music for the film. So that's it's great. great. It's great fun to work with. with, with that's with, really cool. And he's in, he's he's uh, in music too. I mean, that's absolutely that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how how is working with your siblings? Uh, how has that gone over different the different periods of your life? Uh, it, it's always been great. I mean, ultimately, I, I, sibling rivalry is a real thing. Um, you know, who's in charge at the moment is, is a real thing. You know, just because I'm the older brother, does that mean, you know, my final say is yes. So sort of th that whole sibling reality comes with it. But I will say, um, you know, in good relationships with your family, nobody can be counted on more. And, and making anything is really hard. And knowing that you are side by side with people who would lay down, you know, in front of a car just as you would for them is is unique. Um, and, and I wouldn't do it any other way. I mean, to have my brothers with me is just a extraordinary blessing. Yeah. Um, the the thing that was kind of going through my head and and which is a little more clear knowing, you know, um, you know, who your mother was of the two women that your father was in love with. How difficult is it to write a story where <laughs> you have to write a movie about a, your father who literally, you know, his marriage with your mother fell apart because of his love for two women, which to most people that sounds incredulous, but trust me, I've been there. You can love two women at one time uh, and have that be conflicting. Um, you know, how, how difficult was that to write and to, to deal with? You know, honestly, it wasn't difficult to write because it was one of the things that from the beginning I thought was so important to write. I, I ultimately didn't know what the audience was going to think. And, and up until our first test screening, no matter how much I massaged in the editing room, I, I was firmly of the belief that in 2022, when people are looking at this, that, that women would just dislike uh, the character of my father because there's no question he's in love with two women. Um, well, two things happened. One is that wasn't the case at all. Uh, it, it, in all the test screenings, people seem to get almost what you just said. It happened. He literally fell in love with two women. Now, um, in writing it, I knew that to be so core to who he was. I do not believe my father would have ever become my father without the marriage to my mother, nor do I believe he ever would have achieved what he, what he ultimately achieved without his marriage to my stepmother. He genuinely loved them both. Um, he did love them both at the same time, and maybe this was the 70s talking, tried to keep it going maybe longer than he could have had having them both together. Yeah. Um, but, but, but you said that, and I think that's so true. It, it does happen, it can happen, and it happened for him. And I thought that was such an interesting story to tell, because I hadn't seen that done before, where you tried to make a character that hopefully we care something about, but you saw him for all those flaws, and that was a that was a big one, um, it, depending upon how you looked at it. Yet if you ask my mother, she would say, no, I was with him for the exact amount of time. And ultimately, I didn't want to go where he was going. And, and she, on her own terms, sort of ended it. And if you ask my, my stepmother, Joyce, um, they were just meant to be from the moment that they, they connected. So 
it was a true love story. It was two love stories. And um, that was something I, I set out early to try to tackle with complete um, uh, cognizance and fear that it might turn people off. And gratefully, so far, it has. Um, I think people really understand it. Yeah, no, actually, I, I think that you, you present it in a way where um, it's not a guy, let's say, for lack of a better word, trolling for you know, that's right someone <laughs> that's know. right he literally gets knocked off his ass by falling by this other woman and now now what do you do basically that's that's his struggle now what does he do yeah uh, and that's what i wanted to explore what, what happened well and also he he's in an industry where allowing yourself to indulge in excess obviously no <laughs> is question. not frowned upon <laughs> no, no question and, and there was something about the time of that too you know we're talking about the the, the mid to late 70s um, yeah, but I, the, but I think, that, I think it's a real just, dynamic now too. Yeah, I think that yeah it, it, it was just an age where people were experimenting more and maybe, yeah, you know, the, the, not to get too deep into this, but I, it seemed, your mother's, uh, from your viewpoint in the film, seemed a little bit more old fashioned in, in a lot of ways, which makes and, sense. And I mean, it still was the seventies. Even now, I don't think, I don't, you know, people are, I don't think a lot of people are as progressive as they champion sometimes, like for themselves. You know, they could they could champion other people, you know, in, in their lifestyles and, and different things. I think sometimes but sometimes I think people themselves aren't as progressive to be able to even now handle something like that. I think that's really, really right. I think in the 70s, look, we were coming out of the 60s. That was a very challenging time psychologically yeah. and politically everything and i think in the 70s people just wanted to just express and just be and and while yes there's a lot of that that um thinking today i think it's a lot more thinking than doing today and i think back then it was a lot more doing i think people just let themselves be for a minute yeah. well, i think that was there, that was a frustrating period of time there was also a lot of social lubrication <laughs> and, and that's also very true, <laughs> yeah, also true. <laughs> um you know, the other thing I love is that it's a movie primarily about the 70s, which uh, in music biopics, we don't have as much about that period. We have a lot that covers the 60s, a decent amount that covers the 50s, but the 70s, you know, it even, you know, obviously some later decades still were, were, were lagging on. Um, and I think the 70s, I know a lot of people my age remember the 70s as kind of a dirty kind of weird tacky sort of decade but for me the 70s i thought i still look upon falling maybe because i was born in the 70s and you know i i remember them fondly in a certain way i remember you know falling in love with different things you know tv and and movies and stuff like that so it's just i i you know i also love the fact that it it's a 70s you know set film and, and, I, and I love that about the movie too. Um, obviously that was, that was a period of time for him that was really the time. So that was kind of what I was going to tell. Right. But when I went back and really kind of looked at other, other things that did put their toe in the 70s, it was almost what you just said. People thought about, oh, the, the hair was too big. The colors were too big. The style was terrible. Uh, the music was terrible. Blah, blah. But that really, if you think about it, some of our greatest clothing designers came out of that period of time. You know, Norma Kamali, who was a dear friend of my, of my, my stepmom Joyce's, you know, came up with the idea of the crazy sleeping bag uh, jacket because it was cold outside of Studio 54. So she brought sleeping bag. People, some of the best designers came out of that period. Um, if you actually look at the photos from Studio 54, those people look great. We've yeah. thought about it in hindsight going, oh, it was all too much. But actually it was extraordinarily stylistic. And the music, for the love of God, you know, yes, it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But as we say in the movie, it was sex before it was deadly. Yes, it was drugs. It was drugs before they got crazy. But the music, the music was extraordinary. So uh, what was important to me was to not over 70s to 70s, to not over period to period, but to embrace everything that I thought was beautiful about that time and not make it a joke, which ultimately is what I thought most 70s people that, that there have been have all used it as a bit of a joke. Let's make the hair really silly. Let's make the clothes really silly. Um, and and that's just not what it felt like if you were in it. Uh, yeah. and, and that's what I was trying to capture. Yeah. Uh, I do want to mention um, the you know, the movie's gone through a lot of uh, changes since you've been trying to get it made. I, sure. I read that originally Justin Timberlake was going to play your father. 
we developed it for years together, Justin and I. Absolutely. Yeah. What uh, ultimately the the timing you know didn't work uh, out. Know, it was just, you know, Justin was one of the first people that I really um, said, I didn't even have a script when Justin got involved in the picture. And, and um, I just, as I was pitching the story at the time, I just said, let me tell you the greatest hits of my dad's life and kind of told him and, um, and, and he really wanted to do it. At the time, he was much more focused on an acting career. Um, and then as the movie was being developed, you know, as, as would be the case with someone like Justin, he suddenly, you know, had the idea for the next album and the next album happened to be the 2020 experience, which had, you know, multiple albums and then a tour associated with it. So, he, so his music calling kept pulling him and it kept kind of pushing us further and further back. And for a while, you know, we kept kind of going along, but, but ultimately the music was a bigger draw for him than, than really committing to doing acting at the time. Um, so it really just became about timing, uh, but he yeah. was wonderful and, and, and I had a great time developing with him. Yeah, he seems to have stepped away from acting a, a bit yeah. over the years. Uh, but I think Jeremy Jordan, who uh, I I know I had se- I, I I he was on a bunch of CW superhero movie uh, shows yeah, yeah. that I don't I don't necessarily remember his character or might have he might have played the character after I stopped watching some of them. But um, you know he's really good in it. Um, but I, I I guess we have to wrap up. I, I I thought I honestly thought we had a little bit longer, but. Um, what, uh, well, just for, to make sure I say again, Spinning Goals in theaters, March 31st, please be, check uh, your local listings for, you know, your theaters. Uh, what is next on the agenda for you? We actually, ju- uh, I'm actually speaking to you from Italy, where, where I just finished shooting um, my next film, uh, which is a really, really uh, fun uh, original pop musical version of Romeo and Juliet. It's set in 1301, so it's set yeah. in period uh, with horses and swords and uh, kind of twist on what we think we know about um, about Shakespeare's story, but all with original pop music written by my brother. Uh, again, uh, just an extraordinary song. Um, so nice. we just finished shooting that in Italy uh, last month. Uh, so I'm here to, uh, posting right now. Okay. Is there anybody we might know that's starring in it? We got Rebel Wilson, who plays uh, Lady Capulet, um, and uh, Rupert Everett plays Lord Capulet, the great Sir Derek Jacobi plays uh, Friar Lawrence, and then coming from our Spinning Gold cast, because I love so many of them, uh, Jason Isaacs, who played my grandfather in Spinning oh, Gold, yeah. plays Lord Montague. Um, Lettucey, who plays Gladys Knight in Spinning Gold, plays a part. Uh, Taylor Parks, who plays Donna Summer in Spinning Gold, uh, plays a part. So uh, Dan Fogler, who plays uh, in Spinning yeah. Gold, plays oh, yeah. the Apothecary. So a, a really fun cast and some fabulous young kids. All right, awesome. Well, uh, Tim, I, I really thank you for the time today. Uh, it was a great pleasure, pleasure speaking to you. Hopefully we get to talk again. Uh, good good luck with Spinning Gold and, and uh, the next film, okay? Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. All right, you have a good day. You too. Be well. All right, bye.